Hey, Andy, I see you're on here. A little um, audio check. If anybody can hear me, just make a comment in the uh, comment section there. Appreciate it. Help if I unmute there. Good evening, everybody. Looks like we still have people trickling in. Um, a couple just very short announcements before I introduce our, our guest for tonight. Um, Wooly Buggers is having the second annual um, Clay Baker Fish Out, April 30th at um, Kleiner Park in Meridian. Um, we do need more volunteers. Um, so if you're able to help out in, in some some capacity there, um, I'd like you to reach out to Jane McEvitt on the TU board. Um, and I, I'll try to grab, or Jane, if you feel comfortable putting your um, email address or your, or your number in there, you could do that. Or, or you could just, you know, people can refer to the website and we can probably get some information out that way. Um, Next month, uh, we'll be hosting um, a presentation from Rick Williams on, on salmon recovery. Uh, Rick has uh, finished a second book on the topic of salmon recovery and has been consulting uh, with Mike Simpson on the current, you know, Columbia River drainage, Snake River issues, um, salmon steelhead recovery. Um, so that should be a good topic that everybody probably is, um, you know, front and center on a lot of people's um, mind right now. Um, and, and that's why we do some of these uh, meetings like this to kind of, you know, talk about a lot of those um, current topics that are very relevant to uh, cold water fisheries uh, conservation. Um, and so that brings us to our tonight's um, presentation. Richie Carmichael from um, Biomark, um, a local Boise company, um, started rather small i know a little bit of that historically but i'll let richie go into all that um do a ton of really cool fisheries conservation you know data driven projects trying to you know find uh results and all that sort of stuff um and they do it worldwide but a, a lot of it started right here in the treasure valley and in, in the northwest so um I guess without further ado, you know, comments, you know, any questions you have, you can save it for the end or you can throw comments into the comments section and we'll try to get to it as we go. Um, but uh, welcome, Richie, and thanks for taking the time to uh, talk to us tonight. Right on. Thanks, Chris, and thanks everybody for attending. Uh, thank you to the Ted Trueblood chapter for reaching out. Um, <clears throat> really happy to be here. Really excited to share some of the uh, some of the work we've done uh, conservation related specifically with uh, Salmonid. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and get started. Hopefully. 
And I apologize, I'm coming to you live from my kitchen. So if you hear a baby in the background, that's just my daughter getting excited about fishing. Um, so as Chris mentioned, I'm Richie Carmichael. I'm with uh, Biomark. Um, we're a Boise-based company um, working primarily in conservation for salmon and steelhead. And I'll get into that a little bit more here in a bit. But uh, I'm a University of Idaho graduate. I studied eco-hydraulics and civil engineering at the Center for Eco-Hydraulics Research here in Boise, Idaho, at the Water Center across from Whole Foods. Uh, I've been working in conservation, specifically uh, Columbia Basin salmonid research and conservation since about 2010. I was actually a recipient of a Ted Trueblood chapter scholarship for outstanding graduate work, uh, which culminated in a, a series of publications, one of which I have listed here. If anyone's interested, I can share that with the group. Um, I'm an avid outdoorsman. I love fly fishing. I love rafting. I love hunting. Uh, really, fishing and fisheries are my passion. Um, and I'm currently serving as the professional services lead for, it's a little confusing, but uh, Merck Animal Health. Um, give me one second. I'll see if I can get my daughter to quiet quiet down. Hey, mom, can you, can you take her? Yeah. Thanks. She's being crazy. Um, I think we'll be all right, Richie. <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time, right? So <laughs> she's just really excited. Um, <laughs> so just a little bit of background. Um, Biomark was acquired in 2008 from by a company called Allflex, and subsequently Allflex was acquired in 2020 by Merck Animal Health. Uh, so Biomark is part of the Merck Animal Health portfolio. Not much has changed with Biomark other than we've kind of expanded. Uh, our conservation offerings and um, we we sort of bring forward a, a combination of tech and biopharma now but I'm going to mostly talk about um, the technology and how we apply it here in the Columbia Basin for conservation. So Biomark was established in 1990 by Don Park. Don was a research scientist with NOAA. Uh, he identified radio frequency identification as a potential tool to aid in research and conservation and recovery of Columbia Basin Salmonids. Uh, so early on, Biomark began as a, just a, a distributor of, of tags and, and readers and, uh, and some services geared towards conservation specifically for the Columbia Basin. Uh, fast forward roughly 30 years, and Biomark is now the worldwide leader in, in identification solutions. Uh, and we have uh, projects all around the world we have offices in Europe, uh, Asia, Iceland, and Chile, uh, and we really focus on, on fisheries, but we also have projects with uh, Arctic fox, penguins, amphibians, uh, reptiles. So we, we're really kind of dabbling in a lot of different spaces, any, any, anywhere where somebody might need to uh, uniquely identify an animal or an organism. Uh, typically, Biomark is the group that can provide the equipment, uh, the tags, and the services to help aid researchers in that. Uh, so some people might be asking, what is RFID or what is uh, PIT or Passive Integrated Transponder Tag? So the easiest way to think about them is it's it's just a microchip or a little little tiny piece of rice with uh, some copper and ferrite in it. It does not have a battery. It's known as a, as a passive tag. So essentially uh, what happens is you have um, an antenna. So that's what we have here is, a, is an in-stream antenna, floating antenna, some handheld antennas. Um, and essentially what you have is an antenna that is creating a magnetic field. When the tag gets close enough to that field, it uh, ignites the tag, which elicits a response back to the antenna. And then it reads a unique ID. So you can kind of think of it as a just a unique series of numbers for each individual tag. Um, and as you can see here, these tags can be quite small. Our most common one is are these 12 millimeter. These are our, our highest performing and highest uh, best-selling tags and these are the ones that that people tend to use most often um, and they're about well 12 millimeters uh, we also offer some other types of tags that can measure temperature and, and um, orientation and accelerometer data and stuff like that but primarily we're talking about uh, passive uh, 12 millimeter tags that can be implanted into fish typically into the body cavity um, and they're lifetime tags so the batteries never run out and that's really important when you're talking about some of these longer lived organisms. So I'm just gonna dive right into uh, some of the most important aspects of RFID technology. So because the tags are passive, meaning they don't have a battery, um, they have to 
come into contact with that magnetic field that the antenna is producing. So one of the really unique things about Biomark is we have in-house production and we have in-house research and development to build custom antennas. Uh, so here you see sort of the left series of pictures are antennas that can be put into uh, fish passage facilities such as fish ladders. And these can be a variety of different shapes and sizes. You have slot antennas, you have um, smaller ones down low, larger spillway antennas as well. And then you also have in-river antennas, which is what you see in the bottom right. And these antennas are typically made of HTPE plastic. We also offer cord antennas, which is the top right picture, which is a flexible cord that can be shaped in different ways. And these are kind of our bread and butter. The in-stream antennas are, are really the most important antennas that we build for Columbia Basin research specifically. Uh, we have sites all over the Columbia Basin in almost every single watershed tributary. Uh, and and these, these ones in river are known as pass. In this case, the fish will swim over the antenna and we will get a detection, some information about when that tag was deployed, anywhere else that that fish may have been detected. That all comes from a data centralized database. And you can sort of look at the life history or the capture history of that fish through time and space. Uh, the ones that are on the left are in pass through orientation. So the fish will actually swim through the antenna and we'll get a detection that way. So those are kind of the two main differences between pass, pass by or pass over and pass through. Uh, here's just some more examples of some of our European installations where we have uh, corded antennas and HTPE antennas installed in river in pass-through orientation. And one of the benefits of pass-through orientation is that um, you essentially are reading the entire water column. So your detection probability, the, the odds that you're going to capture that fish is much higher than if it is in pass over. Hey, Richie, quick question about the antennas wise is that <clears throat> what's the life of the antennas? you know, those in-stream ones? So barring any um, major flood event, ice event, uh, we these antennas have lasted, uh, we have some that are still in place 20, 25 years. We've updated them, so the technology has changed a bit. We've improved them through time, but typically these antennas can last a very long time as long as you don't have some major damage that uh, can break them or, or get water into them. Yeah, I imagine those rigid, the, the HDPE stuff is probably pretty durable, right? So It is, yeah. And we actually do, so a lot of the fusion uh, happens here in Boise. We have a local company that builds the antennas, and then we actually plastic weld them and put all the guts and the parts into them. So they're very, um, very robust, very sturdy. Cool, thanks. Yep, and uh, here are just some examples of antennas that have been installed in fish traps. Uh, we also have some custom antennas here on culverts and bridges, so they take all they tend to take all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Um, put the this slide in here just to give an idea of the scale of some of these projects that we've worked on. So the one in the top right is actually a um, a lock and fill at a big dam in Europe. So they were interested in understanding if adding water to the the lock and pulling water out was moving fish in and out. And so we installed some very large antennas there. We also have antennas in all the fish bypass systems on all the major uh, Columbia and Snake River dams as well. So just to give an idea of, of sort of the scale of some of these projects we're working on, they're pretty, pretty extensive. Uh, this was a project. Um, I like to talk about this one a little bit because it's really relevant to the Columbia Basin. So this is the spillway face of Lower Granite Dam. Uh, some of you are probably aware of the court ordered or court mandated spill during peak juvenile uh, out migration periods. So to help encourage and speed up and improve passage, uh, the court has mandated that they spill during certain times of the year. So spill water over the spillway. And what that created was a situation where we were unable to detect those fish because they weren't going through the ladder or the fish bypass system. So we had no, no way to really assess or understand if that increased uh, flow rate and spill was improving survival. So we worked with NOAA over the course of 10 years to develop these specific antennas that could read fish moving at extremely high rates of speed. And they were actually permanently put in place and cemented in place into Lower Granite Dam into the spillway face. So what you'll see here and all these are these, we call them our OG antennas and they're all these white rectangles that have been put in three rows here. And what that does is it just provides um, more detection points for researchers to better understand and constrain the survival and, and the passage success through that particular location. 
So if we dive in a little bit closer into the Columbia River Basin and talk a bit more about um, how this technology is utilized and how researchers tend to use it, um, talk a little bit specifically about some of the projects that I've worked on. Um, but first, look at a timeline of the Columbia Basin and where Biomark kind of fits in there. So around the 30s to the early 50s, you have some of the major hydropower systems going into the Columbia and the Snake River. Um, the 70s to 90s, you have a lot of the major population groups or uh, major evolutionary units getting listed as endangered. Biomark is founded in 1990. Uh, from the 90s to the 2000s, you start to see some of these standardized data collection uh, protocols coming online, some centralized databases for researchers to share their pit tag data across the watershed. And then in the 2010s, you see some of these other models such as uh, the Integrated Status Effectiveness Monitoring Program or the Columbia Habitat Monitoring Program, some standardized fish and habitat sampling coming online and then expanding into the into the 2020s. You start to see some of this, really the, the, the road that we paved in the Columbia Basin start to expand worldwide when some of these other countries look at the model of the Columbia, not necessarily as a success story for recovery, but really um, to piggyback on some of the research that's already been put forth in the Columbia in, in terms of constraining life histories and understanding limiting factors. Um, so a lot of these things that we're seeing in the Columbia Basin are starting to be mirrored worldwide in terms of uh, status and trend monitoring and assessment of, of stocks and assessment of recoveries. So I'm gonna talk a bit about RFID utility in the Columbia Basin. I'm gonna to touch uh, a little bit on how we've leveraged RFID to inform life history strategies or to identify life histories or variable life history strategies, uh, how we use RFID to identify limiting factors to recovery, uh, a little bit about how RFID can be leveraged for looking at movement, survival, and species distribution. Um, I won't necessarily touch on predation, but it's certainly something that you can leverage RFID uh, for when you talk about movement and survival. And then just a little bit about the four H's of recovery. So that's hatchery, harvest, hydropower, and habitat, which tends to be sort of the common courtesy or, or common currency that we use when we talk about recovery. Those four H's are, are the four major components of, of assessing viability and recovery. So a lot of this is gonna be geared towards the Snake River and specifically the Lemhi River, because that's where I spent a lot of my time in my earlier career uh, was, was uh, researching recovery options and doing a lot of habitat and fisheries analysis in the Lemhi. So a lot of these examples I have are, are sort of geared towards the Lemhi, but what you're seeing on the top there is sort of a, a complicated uh, path, what we would call is all the pathways that a potential juvenile Chinook could take out of the Lemhi. Most of the, the spawning in the Lemhi occurs in the upper Lemhi and in Hayden Creek. So we have sort of this idea of, of all of the different life histories that those fish could take. Um, and each one of those lines, so if we take, for example, this first break here, par or overwinter in Hayden Lemhi, um, essentially what that means is these fish are leaving as par or they're staying to overwinter in the Hayden or, or in the upper Lemhi. And essentially what we can do with pit tag data and pit tag detections is assess what the survival of those fish are for those variable pieces of their life history. So you can see here that fish that choose to stay as par, or excuse me, move down as par, um, survive at a much higher rate than fish that tend to overwinter in Hayden and Lemhi. And as you move down through the pathways, you see that fish that overwinter in the lower Lemhi after they come out as par tend to survive at a much higher rate than fish that move out as pre-smolts to the mouth of the Lemhi. Um, this is actually a bad number here because we had a really low sample size. Fish don't survive at 130%, so discard that one. Um, and then you can see here fish that overwinter in the salmon tend to survive at about 33%. Fish that head all the way down to granite in the spring as true smolts um, survive at 31%. And this is all cumulative moving downstream. So of the 57% that survived, 20% may have survived as pre-smolts, 50% may have survived as uh, over winter and then left as smolts. So this information can be uh, used to sort of decide what type of restorations and where restorations may take place. So if we know that fish that tend to overwinter in the upper or lower Lemhi are more successful in surviving to granite, 
we may choose to prioritize restoration in that given location, or they may choose to do a different type of restoration action that would encourage those fish to overwinter in a given location. So it's just really helpful to understand uh, the variable life histories for this spe uh, specific population and sort of how those different life histories perform relative to other options that they may have uh, throughout their life as they make their way to the ocean. Another really fun project I worked on, and this is actually myself and one of my old colleagues, Braden Lott, um, floating the Lemhi River in the middle of winter. It was about 10 degrees that day. And we were floating um, essentially floatable pit tag antennas on the front and back of this cat boat. And we were able to get pit tag detections with GPS location. So anytime that we detected a fish, um, our reader would take a GPS location in that spot and then make some really nice maps uh, looking at how fish distribute through the Lemhi in the winter. Again, this is helpful information for, for basin managers and restoration practitioners to understand sort of how these fish are distributing through the winter and what, what types of habitats or what mosaics of habitats they're really keying in on. Um, this is not a great way to understand total population size, but it gives you an idea of relative abundance because you don't really know your detection probability, but you can plot these, these detections out through space and time and sort of understand how fish are moving or not moving in the winter and as you move into spring. Another really neat way that we leverage pit tag data is to estimate adult escapement throughout the Columbia Basin. So the first step when you're doing that is to take sort of this dendritic or linear network that we have on the left and each black dot represents an in-stream pit tag detection site. You then build that into a program. In this case, it was built in the R statistical software and sort of how that, um, this is a nice plot just showing how the, the map on the left and all of the pit tag interrogation sites sort of distribute on the right and what that dendritic network or that linear network might look like and all the different options that these fish might have as they move downstream. Um, and what's really fun about this is we have some really neat models that can estimate the number of fish in a given location. So this is a really nice example. The state of Washington uh, leverages this model and leverages our pit tag data to decide when and where to open and close fisheries. So the idea being that you can parse out native origin fish and hatchery origin fish and sort of it results in something like this where if you see these plots on the right, these are these correspond with, with some of these fishing areas that are in this map here. So you have the Wanapum, Rock Island, Rocky Reach, Wells, Chief Joe. Um, and the idea being that you would want to encourage anglers to target hatchery fish to limit their interactions with wild fish. So we built a uh, password protected real-time escapement um, GUI, a graphic user interface for the state of Washington to leverage to then click on and off these different plots to look at how fish are distributing through their fisheries. And then they can open and close fisheries accordingly. So the idea being, well, if we look at Rocky Reach to Wells Dam as an example, um, we have a low number of natural origin fish and a fairly low number of hatchery origin fish. So that's probably not a fishery you would want to open. Uh, whereas the lower NTAT to Ardenvoir, uh, really high estimate of natural origin fish, low estimate of hatchery origin fish. Again, probably not a fishery you would open. Um, vice versa, lower Okanagan whales to Chief Joe, high estimations of wild, or excuse me, of hatchery origin fish with low numbers of natural origin fish. So that would be um, good candidates for fisheries to be open. So it's just a really nice tool for um, managers to to really encourage folks to go out and fish in the right places and interact with the fish that we're hoping they're going to catch uh, being hatchery origin and as opposed to wild or, or native origin. Um, this is also a great tool for hatchery managers because they can estimate how many fish they may be having returned to their um, to their hatchery as broodstock. So this is just another tool sort of in the toolkit to manage fishing, uh, manage harvest and manage hatchery broodstock. You're saying I could get access to this data in real time? <laughs> I can get access to it. <laughs> oh, that's not what I heard. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. All, um, all of these pit tag detection data are available uh, through Pitagus, but this 
this pretty complicated um, dam and a branch model would not be available for you to run, and these results would not generally that's, be available to the public. That's and super you can cool, see this though. is dated back to 2015, so these yeah. are these are pretty old results. But just an example of of how we're leveraging yeah, um, sure. these data. So some of you may recognize this spot. Um, this is what I've always termed as the glory hole up at Stib Night. Um, typically, I, I tend not to tell people where this is because it's a nice fishing spot, but I'll tell this group. Um, so we actually worked with uh, some of the contractors. So th they're planning to dig the glory hole much deeper, and there's a big reclamation effort in, in place. And where you stand on that, it, it's not really relevant to this, um, and I won't touch on the politics and the, the impacts of that. But um, we installed some pit tag antennas down here, and we wanted to know or constrain or understand how uh, bull trout and cutthroat trout were leveraging this big pool. Um, so what we did was we placed pit tag antennas down there, and there are actually temporary antennas up here at the head to see if there was any movement above here, and there was not. Um, and so we developed sort of this complicated mark recapture study, and th this is sort of just a, a depiction of that. Um, so we had three seining mark recap um, events through time and through time essentially, and we were able to calculate uh, how many bull trout and how many cutthroat trout were present in in the glory hole uh, throughout each one of these. So it's just a good way for uh, folks to understand the species distribution. Um, for all of our mark events, we were marking these fish with uh, pit tags. So essentially, what that means is we're going out and we're we're capturing them and any fish that we haven't captured prior gets a pit tag inserted into it. Um, and then based on the number of those fish that you recapture through time, uh, you can estimate the population size. And the reason we wanted to have those pit tag antennas there at the bottom was because we could account for fish migrating in and out and it just improves your estimate uh, of population size quite dramatically. And so here what I'm showing is just the uh, P is probability of capture. And so you need to constrain your probability of capture to then get an estimate of N, which is just the number of fish in the given location. So you can see here that, um, yeah, there are a pretty significant number of bull trout in there, and there's a fairly high number of, of cutthroat trout as well. So prior to conducting this study, uh, other than me going and catching those fish, I didn't really, or we didn't really have a great idea of, of the total population or the number of fish that were utilizing uh, the glory hole. And then by having those pit tag antennas there, uh, continuously detecting fish as they moved in and out, we could get some idea of seasonality and how these fish were moving upstream and downstream and in and out of the glory hole. So it's just provides a really nice way to, um, to account for fish moving in and out when you're trying to get your population estimate, but then it also gives you continuous data through time of how those fish are moving in and out of the habitat. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I know I moved pretty quickly through that, but um, talk a little bit about how we are leveraging, I would say, pit tag data in a way, but um, some of the some of the machine learning and uh, computer vision stuff that we're doing to sort of support uh, habitat restoration and habitat effectiveness or restoration effectiveness monitoring. Um, so we've taken sort of some legacy data sets. We have roughly... Uh, 10 years of on the ground fish data. So very similar to uh, talking about the Mark Recapture uh, project in the Glory Hole or at Stib Night. Uh, we can leverage Mark Recapture models to understand how many fish are in a given stretch of river. We can pair that information with measured habitat or historical measured habitat information. Uh, so that's what you see here on the right is a survey crew out physically surveying the river. I think one of them is actually diving for a temperature probe here. Um, and we can pair those two data sets together through time and space. And so what we did was we took roughly 300 sites for Chinook spread across the Columbia Basin, 600 population estimates at the site scale. So these are anywhere from 200 to 600 meter reaches. Uh, so we have abundance estimates for Chinook, abundance estimates for steelhead. And then we can pair that with habitat data at that same scale. Uh, we also developed these models for winter, uh, winter pre-smolts to try and understand how the seasonality of these fish changes and their habitat needs and their habitat preferences change. And then in the winter, we were primarily focused on Chinook as the, as the focal species. 
So we developed uh, what we call a quantile random forest, and I'm not gonna go too far into the weeds about this, but essentially the reason we went down the random forest route was because oftentimes fisheries and their the way they relate to their habitat is nonlinear. So random forests can account for nonlinear relationships between your response variable and your covariates. In this case, our response is abundance. How many fish are there? Our covariates are the measured habitat in this case. Um, it can also incorporate habitat correlation. So many times you see uh, things correlated together. So channel unit frequency, the number of channel units is oftentimes correlated with sinuosity or gradient. So this can account for interactions among habitat variables. Um, it can give you a very robust set of predictions. So you can think about it a little like a Plinko board. You have your response variable, which is the abundance. You have all of these habitat metrics spread across the board. And the random forest is going to go run thousands and thousands of simulations, pairing all of this habitat information to get to your response. And what that does is it just provides a really nice distribution of all of the potential abundance that could be at a given site. Um, and then we took it one step further from just estimating abundance, and we really wanted to get at this idea of carrying capacity. So oftentimes when you go and do a restoration, you may never see the uplift of that restoration because of confounding factors, downstream migration, uh, ocean conditions. So we wanted to understand, well, if you go and do a restoration, are you lifting the capacity? How many fish can the habitat support pre and post restoration? Um, and that sort of hinges on this idea of quantile regression. So you can imagine in a perfect world in this top plot here, let's say, for example, uh, the number of fish or the carrying capacity of fish in a given pool is strictly driven by the number of pieces of wood, right? So as you add more wood, you would expect your capacity to go up. And that might be true, but there also might be a bull trout sitting in that pool that we don't know about that's eating all the fish. Or there may be some other habitat characteristic that sort of drives that distribution into what we would call a wedge. So in a perfect world, you have sort of one habitat covariant driving capacity in a one-to-one -one relationship or linear like we have here. But in reality, you have sort of this wedge distribution because of unmeasured factors at many of the sites or interactions between the habitat. But we're still interested in understanding this sort of upper 90th quantile because there's some supporting evidence that would suggest the upper 90th or as you approach that sort of upper quantile, you're approaching the capacity that the habitat can support, right? So we're really interested in trying to get at that idea of capacity. And so that's why we chose this combination of a, of a quantile regression and a random forest model. So the really important thing is, is we have all of this information at the site level, right? So I mentioned we have 300 to 600 sites where we've, where we've done this, we've paired fish and habitat and we've estimated the carrying capacity, but that only gets you so far. So then we leverage global, globally available attributes or spatially continuous information that is derived from things like satellites uh, to then spread those predictions or build an extrapolation model across the landscape, right? So that's what you have here is on the left, you have uh, the number of juvenile Chinook per meter squared that the that the, um, the habitat can support. And on the right, you sort of have a continuous data set of all of the all of the capacities that the entire watershed could support um, given given things like passage and um, irrigation withdrawals and barriers and such. So, these are sort of constrained to contemporary distributions uh, across the habitat. And really what's so great about this and the utility of it is first and foremost, you can put these into maps, right? You can visually identify areas of high and low capacity um, that can help direct restoration. It can help prioritize restoration. Uh, it's information that you can convey to stakeholders and collaborators. I've found that nothing conveys a message better than a map. Everyone, almost everyone can read a map. Uh, and then the, these types of continuous data, these types of estimates of capacity can be turned into common uh, shape files, which is a common geospatial file or other types of files that can be shared with researchers and collaborators. So the first way we like to use them is to just look at a distribution of capacity across the landscape and kind of understand how that capacity changes through time and space. Another really neat, neat aspect of this model is you can pull out fish and habitat relationships. So 
just imagine these plots essentially if you were to change the wetted width of a given site you would expect your capacity to go up but only to a certain point right so if you get if your river grows and grows and grows you would expect capacity to go up but eventually you sort of see that relationship where it it, it levels off and i like this august temperature plot because it really shows how uh, fish and habitat form nonlinear relationships. So as your habitat, or excuse me, as your temperature goes up, you actually see the carrying capacity go up for Chinook. This is juvenile Chinook, um, but only to a certain point, right? Because as we reach sort of that 12 and a half C or maybe even warmer, we start to see the capacity go down. And so biologically, it makes a lot of sense that, yeah, you have sort of this sweet spot where a certain temperature can drive uh, the habitat to hold more fish. Um, here's another example of fish cover none. This is a little misleading. Essentially, what this is, is as you, as you have more non-fish cover, so you have more areas that are not covered by fish, your capacity, or excuse me, not covered by um, things like woody debris or overhanging vegetation, you would expect that habitat capacity to go down uh, and channel unit frequency. So the number of channel units in a hundred meter reach as you sort of add more and more units and you have more of those interfaces between pools and riffles providing uh, adequate feeding, feeding zones and feeding lanes, you would expect that capacity to go up. So it's just a really nice way to communicate to uh, folks on the ground who are doing restoration. These are the types of things that are driving fish uh, use and fish capacity up or down. And then you can sort of help build those into some of these restoration designs that we see going on the ground. Another really neat way that we leverage this capacity model is to estimate capacity for an entire watershed. So this particular one, we're looking at the Pissimeroi watershed and the number of juveniles that the Pissimeroi juvenile Chinook that the Pissimeroi can hold. Uh, so we estimate that the Pissimeroi can hold roughly, let's call it 300,000 Chinook. And then if you look at a contemporary mean, how many juvenile Chinook have left the Lemhi um, over time. This comes from screw trap data. So we see that, yeah, okay, our capacity estimate is lining up pretty nicely with what you would expect as the contemporary mean. Uh, the contemporary max, maybe one or two years, we had a really productive year and we saw sort of that number jump really high, but you would like to see your capacity and your mean kind of lining up, meaning that your capacity is, is pretty accurate. Um, so you can use those data to compare to what it might take to reach delisting criteria. So for example, the Pissimeroi has a set number of adults that it needs to reach to be delisted as an endangered population. Well, we can back calculate, okay, how many juveniles need to leave the Pissimeroi to bring that many adults back to re reach um, delisting. And so this is pretty clear that if you see MAD is maximum abundance threshold, which is a, just another way to say the number of fish we need to reach delisting, well, it's pretty clear that we have a huge capacity deficit in the Pissimeroi, right? So until we go in there and actually do some on the ground restoration or make some alterations to the morphology and the habitat, we can't really expect to ever reach delisting criteria because we can't support consistently the number of juveniles we need to get the adults back, right? So that's kind of a nice way to convey or to prioritize watersheds to say, okay, if this particular watershed has a really large capacity deficit for juveniles or adults or whatever it may be, maybe we should prioritize that one or vice versa. If this one is really close to having enough capacity to produce the number of juveniles or to support the number of spawners that we need to reach delisting, maybe we just put a little more money or a little more effort into, into reaching that capacity um, threshold because then maybe someday when the dams come out and we actually have the adults returning, we have the space for their for their progeny to seed the habitat, right? So it's just this idea of kind of coming at this complex problem from a completely different perspective. And, and if we actually do get the adults back in the Basimeroi, well, let's take a step back and try and understand, do we have the capacity to support that number of adults that we've listed as, as sort of the recovery goal? And here's just the example of, of we've, built, we've built this model for juveniles uh, par, uh, overwinter juveniles, and then also we have a, a red model or a spawning model as well. And so you can see here pretty obviously what you would expect. Um, the Pistimeroi has more than enough uh, spawner capacity to support our maximum abundance threshold, or maybe 
a maximum abundance threshold plus a little bit there. So that's going to drive where and what types of restoration you're going to do because you're really going to gear these restorations towards supporting juveniles as opposed to trying to encourage or increase spawning. And it's really it's really neat because we can do this. Um, so this is this is specific to the upper salmon. Um, we've built this model across the entire Columbia, but I like to talk about it in terms of the upper salmon because that's fairly close to home. Uh, so you have Yankee Fork, Valley Creek, Upper Salmon, Panther, Pasimeroy, North Fork, Lemhi, East Fork, and you can sort of start to prioritize and look across all of these different watersheds to try and understand where you have really high capacity and really low capacity. And again, that just drives this, this idea of prioritization because unfortunately we don't have the funding to go in and fix every single problem. So this is just another tool in the toolkit for, for state and federal agencies to sort of start to prioritize and make some of those hard decisions about where the money should be spent and what kind of capacity deficit we should be tackling. And another interesting way to kind of look at how uh, the habitat drives drives the capacity. So this is just looking at a channel unit scale um, across across uh, a, a given site in the Lemhi. And what you'll note here is is as fish cover increases, generally you see higher uh, capacity, right? So this is the metric value on the left, and then the bars are colored corresponding to their uh, given carrying capacity. So again, as you would expect, sort of undercuts to increase, you start to see capacity increasing as you would, oh, excuse me, as you would expect fish cover to increase, you start to see ca capacity increasing. Similarly with channel unit frequency, um, you start to see sort of that capacity being driven by some of these metrics that are very easily communi communicated to uh, restoration practitioners and watershed managers. Um, as you see more coarse and fine gravel, you start to see capacity increase, and that's probably a function of morph morphologics, right? So as you have more sediment sorting, less fine sediment, you have cleaner, better gravels, uh, healthier ecosystem, uh, more, more morphologically intact watersheds you would start to see sort of that capacity driving or coming up. And, and this is all based on empirical data. So it's, it's really exciting to sort of see these model results lining up biologically with what we would expect. So shifting gears a little bit, um, as I mentioned, that model is based on measured fish and habitat data. And, and historically that habitat was, was measured by a crew of three to five people across 200 to 600 meter reaches. And some of my graduate work that was actually driven by the scholarship that I received um, from the chapter was investigating how we can leverage airplane mounted sensors and drones to support the habitat assessment to replace boots on the ground to get more efficient uh, coveraging, covering much larger swaths uh, of river. And so we're starting to build in some metrics that are generated from drone imagery. And this is just a really nice example of how we can communicate uh, some of these areas of good and bad habitat. So this is the lower Lemhi and each one of these polygons throughout the river, these are all reaches of the river. Um, each one of them is, is colored by its corresponding capacity estimation. And it's pretty clear to see areas of high capacity, uh, high complexity, floodplain interactions, right? Some of these braided channels, these are all things that we can point to on a map, point to in high resolution imagery to say, okay, re okay, engineers, okay, restoration practitioners, go build more of that as opposed to, well, maybe we don't want to put a single thread channel next to a highway, right? So it's just sort of a really nice way to visually um, convey that message to folks uh, that this is the type of habitat we're looking for and this is what we want to build more of. And then what's really exciting is, is by incorporating the drone imagery, we can go from what we would consider sort of a reach scale, which is 200 meters to a much larger sort of meso habitat scale, right? Which is like four or five kilometers to then the watershed scale because these fish are interacting with habitat throughout the entire watershed. So we really needed this kind of scalable approach uh, from very fine scale to very large scale to to sort of assess the habitat appropriately and to assess the capacity appropriately and to communicate that message to all of the involved parties. 
So right now we're working um, through standardizing data input from the drone to replace the on the ground habitat information. Uh, it's all spatio spatio temporally referenced, so it it lives in real space in a digital world. Uh, we're working on a real time data viewer and storage for researchers to leverage um, some of our machine learning models, and we're working on some automated processing, which I'll talk about here in one second. Uh, so it's really we're in like a really exciting space right now when it comes to leveraging drones and aerial sensors and trying to merge them with uh, historic data sets to leverage all of the all of the data that's available out there. So one of the first things that we did was we started utilizing an infrared camera. So what you see on the left is sort of your standard red, green, blue reflectance, which is what our eyes see. Uh, but we've added several infrared bands. And what those infrared bands do is helps the machine learning algorithms differentiate between things like water and vegetation. So that helps to segment images to understand or to characterize how much of a given um, how much of a given thing is on the habitat, right? How much how much riparian do we have? What type of vegetation is there? Is there large woody debris? Um, how big is the channel? How wide is the channel? What is the deviation of the widths? These are all things that we can extract from imagery that are very relevant for this type of modeling approach and very relevant for fisheries in general. And then we started to build some machine learning algorithms. So this is a restoration site in the Lemhi. And you could expect that if you went out and sent a ground crew out there to go measure and count every single piece of wood, that would be quite time consuming and expensive. Um, scientists are quite expensive. Their hour, hourly rates are pretty high. Uh, so this is just a really nice way to extract or pull out woody features and start to count the area or volume of wood in each given image. And then that metric can be built into our models. Uh, so this particular one just goes across the image and looks at every single individual pixel and decides whether or not that pixel is wood. Uh, we can then add up the number of pixels that are deemed wood and get an area estimate of the amount of wood. So it's very, very basic, but it's a really nice tool to extract wood out of the channel. Another way we're sort of doing this is with satellite imagery. So this is a, just an image or an example on, on the lower salmon or the salmon around the town of, town of salmon. And you can sort of automate land cover classification and understand how much of the floodplain might be made up of a paved road, a meadow, trees, bare earth, et cetera. And those landscape uh, metrics can be built into these similar models. What's also really exciting is you can start to automate things like centerline digitiz digitization. So uh, the centerline of a river can, can reveal all sorts of very, very exciting information about that river, whether it be sinuosity, uh, whether it be meander widths. Um, so we can take sort of the segmented image and generate a center line from it, audix, and feed those back into our machine learning model. And then we're also investigating some deep learning models. So the other models I showed were what we call supervised classification. So you, you as the user actually feed it some real information, and then it gives you a prediction back. Whereas this type of deep learning model uh, can actually go find objects on the landscape and then it can start to count them and, and um, segment them through space. So in this particular one, we have uh, woody debris being identified and outlined, and then we have the channel uh, flowing through here. And so this is one that's just sort of in its infancy state, but we're hoping that this type of deep learning model or what we would call object-based uh, identification is gonna have some really great um, really great impacts in this type of analysis and supporting habitat assessments and then feeding into fish habitat relational models. So this type of thing can pull out and count number of pieces of wood, the wetted channel, individual trees. Eventually it can even probably pull out individual rocks, um, assess substrate distributions, things like that. So we're just sort of diving into this deep learning model approach as well, but um, it's a very nice approach for trying to ass assess uh, fisheries habitat. And then we've actually also worked with, this is my last slide I have here, and then I'll take some questions, but we actually worked with some researchers uh, in Florida who conduct drone surveys for uh, mass migrations of things like black tip sharks and manta rays. So what you see here is just a GIF that we produced of our detector um, finding and tracking a black tip shark and then successfully identifying a manta. And the question I always get was, well, who won in the fight? And I don't really know. They're going to 
intersect each other at some point. But um, when you have sort of these massive migrations, you can use machine learning models to identify count and then assess some of the shoaling behaviors, schooling behaviors, things like that. So historically, some of the researchers, researchers we worked with would have grad students painstakingly going in and, and counting individuals uh, through the drone imagery. And now through some of these machine learning models that we've developed, you can sort of automate that approach uh, and provide some of that information much quicker and, and much more accurately to the researchers. And that's all I have. And I would just open it up for questions. Yeah, that's a ton of information there. Like you're, <clears throat> and what's funny is like you go historically right from all that kind of boots on the ground, you know, just everything probably pen and paper, right? And to mm -hmm. where you guys are, <clears throat> you know, and it's seemingly like overwhelming information, like some of the machine learning language stuff you're doing. But then you can almost you can see at the same time, like as you all get, you know, higher definition cameras, more, you know, all this other stuff, that deep, you know, AI type stuff yep. could actually mean something. Um, and you're just almost skimming the surface when it comes to like what you guys could probably do with that data. So um, yeah, that's kind of crazy. I dabbled with the like we were talking about um vision guided robotics back in the day before I did what I did. And so I was like, God, oh, it's pretty cool. You guys are taking those, you know, drone imagery and identifying, you know, chunks of wood laying around. Totally. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. You cut out <laughs> and you can do it on such a bigger scale instead of doing such small pieces of the uh, stream bed, right? You can, yep. you can do it yep. on a much larger scale and be probably way more accurate for the overall river system. So that's pretty Yeah. Cool. So I forgot to mention that I historically, uh, a habitat crew would take, you know, be a crew of two to three would take maybe two days to do two to 600 meters of stream. And now with the drone, we can go collect, you know, five miles of <laughs> one hour, right? Yeah. Um, and eventually where we would love to get is just, can a machine look at an image of a river and just tell us how many fish it can support, right? Without even going down the road of, well, here's how many pieces of wood there are. Here's what the channel yeah. dynamics are right just here's an image is it good or bad habitat right so that's really where we would love to get to yeah as you feed it more information it's gonna know yeah. eventually you know yep. so that's a little scary but cool at the same time so yeah the technology's there we're just we just have to leverage it yep yep that's just cool um andy did have a question um in the comments there um he and he was talking about you know it kind of allude, it kind of went back to your um the lower granite um uh, array and stuff like that um to a degree um how does high flow or turbidity affect the signal between the tag and detecting antenna um you guys yep. plainly have that is, he says um do you have that pretty much solved um yeah, so um, turbidity doesn't really have any impact on it. Saltwater certainly does. So RFID does not really work in saltwater. Um, but high flows certainly will lower the detection probability. So as you increase depths, um, and we see this a lot with smolts because smolts <coughs> tend to outmigrate higher in the water column. So it'll, it'll essentially lower the probability that that fish will get detected. But the way we do it, the way we structure these systems is we have what we call multi-pass arrays. So you might have a channel spanning array upstream and a channel spanning um, antenna downstream. And so you can use the ratio of, of the number of fish that were detected on the upper and the lower and both. And you can still get a, a pretty tight um, detection probability, but certainly higher flows lower your detection probability, which then in turn, uh, in, it decreases the confidence in your total estimates. Any other questions out there? Just throw them in the comments if you do have any. Um, that was a lot of good information. That's like like data overload, though. So <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. Like, <laughs> projects are the some really neat projects, though. You know, everything from all those little small streams um, to the to the bigger, you know, Columbia River projects. I mean, it's it's you plainly 
your organization has had a, a big impact on the recovery efforts in the Northwest, which is, which is really neat to, you know, be able to talk about. So it's just a little homegrown little organization there. Yeah. And I would just add that if anyone has any more questions or, or anything, you know, just feel free to shoot me an email and um, yeah, I know it was a lot and I tend to talk fast because I get excited about the research we're doing. Uh, so if you need any clarifications or further information, please reach out. Um, oh, Jane did have a question too. Biomark, is Biomark taking the data from outside research projects and analyzing it for them? Um, or are the research agencies collaborating together with Biomark? So for the most part, uh, the agencies will do their own analysis. We we provide some tools for them to leverage when it comes to uh, how well their systems are performing, uh, whether their systems were working at a given time or not. But typically, we provide those data to the customer, and then the then the customer would uh, develop their own models. But we've done quite a bit. Pretty much everything I presented here was done in house at Biomark. Yeah. And then I had this question too, actually, I thought about this, Andy asked, um, have you guys done anything on the lower Boise River, like through town and all that? We haven't, but interestingly enough, we just kicked off a really big Silver Creek project. So we'll be installing 12 separate arrays throughout Silver Creek, and they'll be capturing and marking uh, brown trout and rainbows. So um, we'll be looking at, you know, things like survival, uh, movement and distribution of those fish. So nothing in the Boise, um, but certainly some some trout projects coming online. Uh, the Silver Creek one would be interesting with the uh, the warm water we've had over the last couple of years. So yeah, yeah, and we'll have uh, we're working with some researchers at uh, University of Montana. So we'll be taking all of those sort of spatiotemporal data uh, and building some some movement uh, videos and interactions that folks can look at and see sort of how those fish are moving throughout the watershed and throughout Silver Creek. Oh, that'd be interesting. Um, well, so Richie, I re really appreciate you coming on and uh, giving this presentation to us. It's, uh, you know, Absolutely. it's good to see, you know, that we have organizations like yours, you know, contributing to the conservation effort, you know, in the Pacific Northwest for sure. So. Yeah, my pleasure. Really happy I got to present to you all. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess that wraps it up for us. Um, like Richie said, if you have any additional questions, we can we can always kind of reach out to them. They're a good organization. I'm sure they'll respond. Um, so, uh, yeah. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, I hope it was meaningful. And um, reminder that we have that uh, the Cunning Baker Fish Out you know, and that uh, we need to get some more volunteers. So that's going to be on April 30th at Kleiner. Um, contact Jane McEvitt, you know, if you can help out with that one. Um, and yeah, thanks again, Richie. Have a good yeah. evening. Yeah, thank you so much. And we're signing off.